Yeah, brother Eddie Bowen with us, former pastor of Grace Baptist Church, and our friendship has meant much to me over the years. I don't know whether my friendship to him has meant much, is much, but I'll say one thing. He's been a better friend, I'm sure, than I have been to him, but let that be as it may. Brother Eddie, you come and preach to us now. Well, since they're um, videoing this, I won't cut up too much here, but uh, I, uh, I have to say uh, ditto to Brother Boren. Uh, I, I don't know how I could have better friends. There ain't that many people that let you come down and stay with them every time you turn around and feed you and put you up in a nice bed and, and all those kind of things and just have great fellowship together and thank the Lord so much for it. Uh, we do enjoy the time that we spend together, and um, I just, I, they treat me so many ways, I have to like some of them, so uh, it, it's, it's been really good. And of course, being back at the church is always a good thing. Um, I, I love this church. I think about it all the time, miss it. Uh, it's, you, you develop a special attachment, as pastors know, when you pastor a church. Uh, especially when you pastor one for any length of time, and I was here for 11 years. Hard to r realize sometimes, but uh, it was a great pastorate, and uh, nothing but good, good things uh, to say and to remember uh, from you dear folks. We invite you to turn your Bibles to the book of Second Peter to begin with. I ask you to be a little bit tolerant with me. I got a new Bible. I've had it for years and never used it, but I didn't bring my Bible from church. I haven't been back there recently physically. And so uh, I figured I'd just bring this one so it might take me a little longer to find scriptures. Uh, the other one was kind of trained to go to where it's supposed to go, but this one I might have to delete it a little bit. But um, uh, we want to read here in Second Peter chapter 1, and we want to begin reading um, in uh, verse 16, and then we're going to go over to Second Timothy chapter 3. I'm going to preach to you really, you know, nothing, nothing new, nothing deep, you know, profound uh, in, in one sense, all the Word of God is profound, isn't it? Um, but um, it's something that you know, something that you've heard. But we need to rehearse those things. We need to be reminded of those things. Uh, that's why God gave memorials to Israel, and we have the memorial of the Lord's Supper. And those, it's to remind us over and over again of the wonderful things that God's taught us and is teaching us. Uh, so I hope that it'll be a blessing to you. My prayer is that it'll, it'll bless your heart. It'll challenge you. Uh, a message that doesn't challenge the people is not worth its salt, um, to be honest. I mean, our messages are not to be flowery and just, you know, just to try to please people. Our messages are to be the Word of God that encourages people and challenges people and reminds people of the greatness of God and His uh, working in our life. So let's start looking here at uh, 2 Peter uh, chapter 1, verse 16. It says, we, For we have not followed cunning device fables, when we made known unto you the power of the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. And that is speaking, of course, on the Mount of Transfiguration, I believe, when they, uh, Peter, James, and John saw the, the glory of Christ there when he was transformed before them. For, for he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the uh, excellent glory, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And that is our desire isn't it that one day we will stand before God and we will hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. Of all the things that we could hear, to hear our Savior say that to us is the greatest thing that we can imagine for Jesus to say, well done, good and faithful servant. And then he goes on down and he says, uh, we have uh, also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that ye take heed. That means that you've got something important here and you need to listen to it and you need to practice it. Amen. That you take heed as unto a light that shineth in dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your heart, knowing this first that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And, of course, we understand that basically God 
through the working of the Holy Spirit and the individual writers of the, of the, of the book, uh, is that he moved their hand to write what he wanted us to have. This isn't the words and the mindset and, and the wisdom of men. This is the word of God, uh, the inerrant word of God that we have. And it's an answer to every situation and every event in our life. No matter what the subject is, the word of God has something for us. And so the title of the message today is, what does the Bible, what does the Bible profit me? You know, is there a prophet in the word of God for me? And we know what a prophet is. We all pretty much like prophets. Uh, if you've owned a business, own a business, if you've done any type of work, you do it for a profit. You buy a house, you buy a house intending that one day you will sell it and you will make a profit. You will benefit from that sale of that house. You invest money in the stock market. You invest money in stocks and bonds or in annuities or in a bank savings account. Whatever it is, you don't do it there to lose money, <laughs> unfortunately. It doesn't work that way. I quit investing in the market because every time I invest, I'd buy high and sell low. It doesn't work that way, folks. <laughs> you run out of money eventually. But uh, we do it so that we might profit, get a profit. Well, the Bible today would be challenged by much of the world. Is, is there any profit in it? Is there any value in it? Is there any advantage of ha having the Bible, not only having it, but reading it and having it in your heart and in your mind? Is there any advantage? You would think by the practice of many Christians that there's not. Because if there were and they knew there was an advantage, they would be investing in it. They would be putting it into their mind and into their heart because there's a profit to be had there. And, and that's what we want to try to get across today. The great profit that, that's in the Bible for us, that we, we should be investing our time into it and reading it and, and putting it into our heart so that God can bless us and give us direction in all situations uh, in our life. Give us a, it's, a, it's a lamp that guides our feet and our steps and, and everywhere we go, decisions that we're to make. The Word of God is to direct us. And so there is great profit to be had, I hope to show you, uh, by the time the message is done. If you will now, go over to 2 Timothy chapter 3. I didn't write this. Somebody wrote it, but I don't know where I found it, but I copied it and put it in my message. Uh, I did that this morning, I think. But uh, it, there's a saying that says, the Bible is a book that will change your life. It will. Yes. The Bible will change. Your, this is the word of God. It is quick. It is powerful. It is sharper than any two-edged sword to the dividing asunder of the joint and the marrow. I mean, it, and it will discern our thoughts and our intents of what we're doing. The Bible will change our lives if we invest in it. If we get into it and read it, it doesn't change our lives to own one. You can carry one in your car, in your toolbox. You can have one at home. You can have five or six of them at home. You can carry one to church. It doesn't matter. If you don't get into the book, it's not going to change your life. But if you get into the book and let the book get into you, it will change your life. I guarantee you, you cannot read the Word of God that it will not change your life. If you get into it and study it. 2 Timothy chapter 3, begin reading verse 15. It says, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. If we stopped right there, we see the Bible will change your life. Amen. From a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which is able to, to um, um, let me get my thoughts here, uh, uh, make you wise unto salvation. If you have nothing else in this life but salvation, you have everything. If you have everything in this life and you don't have salvation, you have nothing. Amen. You have nothing. You are nothing. What does it profit a man? There's that word. What does it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his soul? Now, there's double application in that. And I don't know which side some people take on it. Uh, but the word soul there can mean your soul or it also can mean your life. And I think the word life fits here. In some scripture, that actually fits in better with the word life. Uh, what is the profit of man if he gained the whole world but loses his life? You go to heaven and you have nothing. You have no reward. You have nothing to show for uh, this new life that you have. You have no rewards to lay down at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. What did it profit you to live 50 years, 60 years, 80 years, 100 years? You have no profit in that life. It was all wood, hay, and stubble to be burned up and wasted. And so there is great profit to be had, and the Bible will change your life. Verse 16 says, all Scripture... Is given by inspiration of God. 
Every verse, every word is inspired of the Holy Spirit in its writing. This isn't coming from a man. It's not coming from a wise man. It's not coming from the most wise man. It's coming from God, the creator. He's the, he's the maker. He's the, he's the, he's the divine orchi, uh, um, architect of, of all creation. He knows all the stars and hangs them out and calls them by name. He is the one that gave us this book. If we read it, there's profit to be had. There's, there's advantage to be had in the reading of this book. The word profit means to benefit. It's beneficial. There's, there's benefits to reading the Bible. We like benefits, right? Uh, we go to get a job. We, we ask the employer, you know, what's, what are they going to give us? What's my benefit package? We like to get benefits. You know, vacation pay, holiday pay, sick pay, dental pay, you know, health insurance and of course, the salary and all that kind of stuff. We like benefits. The Bible is full. Daily, he loads us with benefits, the psalmist says. There's benefits in here. You get into that book and read it, and you're going to benefit from it. It also means to be useful. The Bible's useful. It's not just a book to read. It's, it's, there's use, it's usefulness to the Bible. You get into it, and you read it, and it helps you learn how to handle money. Do you know that faith and trust and how many times it's believed is mentioned in the Bible, but money's mentioned, money and Materialism is mentioned more than all of those. Money is, you know, money is important. We like money and for what money will do because money is a tool that is useful. Well, this book is useful. It'll tell you how to use your money so that you'll profit overall. And you'll use it the right way and you won't waste the Lord's money. You'll be good stewards with what the Lord gives you. It means it's valuable. All this book, the old Bible, it's a valuable book. When we hold it, we ought to, we ought to cherish it. We ought, to, we ought to have a special feeling about this book when we hold it and when we, when we read it, when we set it down. You know, I, I, I don't set my coffee cup on my Bible. I have a Bible sitting by my lazy boy, and I don't set my coffee cup on my Bible. I don't set my sandwich on my Bible. I don't set the TV guide on the Bible. I don't have a TV guide anymore. You don't physically have those, I don't think, anymore. But this, this book is valuable. It's special, and we ought to treat it as such. When we go by and we see it, it ought, it ought to draw our attention to it. You know, and every day we ought to wake up and you know, get into the book because this is valuable stuff, man. This is good stuff. And, of course, it also means to be helpful. The Bible's helpful. We need help, don't we? The day we're living today, so many challenges, so many things going on, and we need help. We need help. And the Lord Jesus Christ, you know, in the Psalms, I think chapter 46 says, you know, uh, the Lord is very present in the day of trouble. And how is he present to us today? In the book. He's here in this book when we read it with the problems that we're facing and the challenges that we're facing and the pandemic and, and uh, financial uh, loss and all the expectations of things that's going to come. Our, our society's going to change. Our world's going to change. But the Bible has the answer for all of those things. And it comforts us, and as we'll see when we get in a little bit more into the, the message. The Bible is a book that will change your life. The scripture is uh, given by inspiration of God, and it is profitable. It is profitable. The Bible itself, this great book that we just talked about, the everlasting book, you know, the Bible has a lot to say about the Bible. You know, it's an everlasting book. Not one jot, not one tittle is going to be changed. The grass may fade and the flower, or the flower fade and the grass wither away, but the Bible's not going to change. You know, we got this book here, and it's a great, it's a wonderful book, and it's profitable to us. And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That, and I see that sometimes I'll add this little word there, and I don't mean to do any harm to the Word of God, but so that. So that man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. You see, it's profitable to us not only to salvation, because, you know, the Bible says that the, uh, um, the gospel is the power in the salvation, doesn't it? And it's not only profitable to salvation, but it's, it's good for us for good works, because it equips us for all good works, as we'll see. It, it gives us what we need to do the things that God saved us to do. The Bible will do all of that. There's a profit in the Bible. But yet we just let it go. It's almost like we've got $100,000 sitting on the table at home, and it's just sitting there, and it's not doing anything. It's not gaining any interest. You know, now right now, people might have a good argument for having it sit there. But normally, we put it in there and get at least 1% or something, make some profit on the money. Even the Bible talks about usury and giving your money out and getting usury for it, the wisdom behind that. You know, so we want to think about that. We want to think about this book that will change your life. And you've been saved for many years, various years here. 
you've been a member of the Lord's Church for a various number of years, and you've, have, you've seen your life change to some degree. You've seen benefit from being a church member and reading the book. But I guarantee you, you still got room to, to profit from the Bible. Almost like if you were to just start today for the first time, you will start seeing profit in the book that's there for you, just for you, ready for you to help you to learn to, how to serve God and, and where to serve God and all these different things. First of all, I want to talk to you about the Bible confirms us. And by that, it, it, reinst it reinstates us or it um, reinforces us. The Bible reinforces us. It strengthens us. It proves us. So you ever question your salvation? Sometimes people will go through challenges in their lives and, and they'll begin to question, well, am I really saved? And, uh, you know, do I really know the Lord Jesus Christ? And boy, I tell you what, there's no worse place to be than not be sure that you're saved. We, we, we don't believe in a hope-so salvation. We don't believe in a think-so salvation. We believe in a know-so salvation. First John chapter 5, verse 13 says, These things I write unto you, that you may know that you believe. It, it reaffirms us. It strengthens us that we're saved by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, blood, uh, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, um, it makes us safe. The Word of God makes us sure. Somebody else wrote that, and I like it, so I put it in there. Uh, I read these things, and I save them because I, the Lord seems to give them thoughts, thoughts about them at times. But the blood of Christ, it makes us safe. We're safe. We're, we're going to heaven. Our sins are forgiven, past, present, future sins. We're safe in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. But the Word of God makes us sure of that safety. Because sometimes we get away from the Word of God. We can begin to doubt that. And we can begin to question that. Look at John chapter 5, verse 24. I believe this is Brother Francis' favorite verse. You can ask him Wednesday night if you have a mind to. John chapter 5. And in verse 24 says, Verily, verily, truly, truly, listen up, this is important. I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath immediately, present tense, everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is already passed from death unto life. I added the word already, as you know. But you see that assurance. You see how it reaffirms us when we're going through times that makes us question. And, and sometimes we wonder, can, can we really be saved? Are we really saved? Look at chapter 6 and verse 37 um, of the Gospel of John. And we find here it says, All that the Father giveth me shall come unto me. And him that cometh to me I will in no wise, for no reason, no how, cast out. That's what it's telling us here. It's not, we might come to him, those that were given to the Father before the foundation of the world, whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life, they shall come. <laughs> There's no way they're not going to come. The Holy Spirit is going to bring them. He's going to draw them by his holy power. We shall, and nothing's going to separate us from the love of God. You know in Romans what it says. Nothing's going to separate us from the love of God. We shall come and we shall be safe. And that reassures us. Even in the times when we wonder about what's going on in this world, that reassures us. And, and there's many other scriptures that I have, but the, really this message, I, I've actually did a series of this message in my Sunday school class at 12 Ryan. And so uh, I'll, I'll probably be a little bit more in, in, in short in each one of the categories. Uh, could spend more time, but hopefully I'll get enough in there to give you the gist of how the Bible profits us. The second thing the Bible does, it builds us up. When we're first saved, we're babes in Christ. We're just like a babe. A babe can do nothing out of its own. It can't take care of itself. It can't think for itself. It has to be fed. It has to be changed. It has to be uh, uh, led along. It has to be told what to do and what not to do. And the Word of God, it builds us up. That's what the Word of God does for us. Uh, Acts chapter 20, verse 32, if you'll look over there. Acts chapter 20, in verse 32. Uh, earlier, Paul tells them that he has not shunned to uh, declare all of the gospel to them and warns them about 
grievous wolves uh, coming from without and even from within and warns them about being on guard, not to let their guard down. Verse 32, he says, And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. The word of God will build you up. It'll make you stronger. It'll help you in the daily life. Over in the book of Psalms, chapter 1, it says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of the sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. That's important. He's telling us what not to do there. Those are things that we're not going to do if we're going to be blessed. We're not going to walk, stand, and sit in these dangerous places because of the effect that it can have upon our life. But it says, His delight is in the law of the Lord, and in His law does He meditate day and night. The psalmist knew there was profit to be had in this holy book to meditate upon the holy word of God. And that word meditate, from my understanding, is like a cow chewing cud. It just keeps chewing it and chewing it and chewing it till it gets every ounce of uh, uh, nourishment uh, out of it so that it might grow. And that's what we're to do with the word of God. Just chew on it and chew on it and chew on it until we get every ounce of nourishment from it. Uh, Job said that he desired uh, the, the word of God more than his necessary food. Uh, uh, Jeremiah said he did find the word and did eat it. And I mean, it was, it's that, that nourishing aspect of the word of God. And then he goes on down in, in Psalms and he says, uh, he meditates on it day and night and he shall be, because he meditates on it day and night, he shall be like a tree, not a rambling bush that's blown about by every wind of doctrine that comes in. But he shall be like a tree that is planted by the rivers of water, the source of nourishment. And it's by the, being planted by the Bible, the thought here I want you to think of. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth, what? Fruit. When we're saved, the Lord tells us we're to bring forth fruit. 30, 60, 100 fold. That bringeth forth his fruit in his season, and his leaves shall not wither. Oh, listen, the word of God is profitable for us. Colossians chapter 2, verse 7, it says, Rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. As they were taught the word of God, they became rooted and, and built up in the faith. Boy, you know why we struggle with our faith? You know why we, we have problems with daily choices in our lives? Is we're not being built up. We're not being planted by the rivers of water and receiving the nourishment that we need to, to receive. So it makes us sure. It gives us confidence in our salvation. It builds us up. And the next thing the Bible teaches us, we need to be taught. Uh, the Bible says it's profitable for, for doctrine. We need to be taught doctrine. And, and what is doctrine? Well, doctrine is the Word of God. <laughs> to be quite blunt with you, this is doctrine. Now, we understand and we categorize doctrines, uh, such as doctrines of grace and doctrines of the church and, and so on and so forth. But the Bible is doctrine. It's the teachings of God for us. And so the Bible teaches us. It teaches us who God is. It teaches us what God has done and what God is going to do. Uh, it's all in the book. How he's going to do it, when he's going to do it to some degree, uh, it's all in the book. He, it teaches us all the time. Proverbs chapter 2 and verse 6 says, For the Lord giveth wisdom... Out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. The Lord gives us that through his book. We need knowledge and understanding and wisdom. And also instruction, when you read in the book of Proverbs, these are found together frequently. We need that to be able to make decisions and make the right choices. Look at Psalms chapter 19 with me for a moment. Pages sticking together. Psalms chapter 19, let's just begin reading in verse 9. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. Now you understand that these words are uh, synonymous with the Bible. Uh, the word uh, statutes, judgments, and all these different words that are used in Psalms chapter 119, uh, they all are ref references to the word of God. Uh, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they, are what? The word of God. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, and much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is my servant warned, and in the keeping of them there is great profit, there is great reward. Uh, uh, who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. How, do you, how does that happen? Through the word of God. 
The Word of God reveals things to us that we don't even know ourselves going on. We don't even realize sometimes that we're slipping away, that we're backsliding. You know, if you're not closer to God today than you were the day you were saved, you're backsliding. There's no neutral ground. There's no place where you reach a certain level and just stay there. You're either going forward for Christ or you're going backwards, one or the other. You have to keep moving forward. It's like rowing in a current. You've got to keep rowing. The minute you stop, you go back. And sometimes we don't even realize that we've drifted farther from God. We didn't realize that we've moved. The psalmist David, in many of his psalms, he would cry out, Oh, Lord, where have you gone? And then by the end of the chapter, he'd say, Oh, you didn't go anywhere I did. <laughs> I realized I'm the one that moved, you know, and he comes back. And, and the word of God brings us to that awareness. I've moved away from God. I'm not as close to him as I used to be. I don't love him as much as I should love him. And the word of God does that for us. And we ought to do it. And now once we learn the word of God, we have an obligation to teach others the word of God. Amen. And we need to learn it so that we can teach others. That's our job. Second Timothy said that we're, we've been taught and we're to teach others. Second Timothy chapter 2, I think it is. Uh, we'll go there in just a minute. Look at uh, Psalms chapter, or Proverbs chapter 9, verse 9. Proverbs chapter 9 and verse 9. He says, Give instruction to a wise man, and he will get wiser. Teach a just man, and he will increase in learning. If we, if we teach people the word of God, They'll increase in learning, and then what will they do with it? Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2. Second Timothy chapter 2, if I can never get my pages over there. And verse 2. Well, let's just read verse 1. He goes on and says, Thou therefore, and because, therefore, go back to what it's there for, the things that were said in the first chapter. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in, in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, that unmerited favor that is in Christ Jesus, and the things which thou hast heard of me among many witnesses. The same, not something different, <laughs> but the same thing that you've heard of me, commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. So when, when the Bible teaches us, when we're family devotion, secret devotion, setting under our pastor, and we learn something, then we're to take that and teach others. We're to share that truth. And you know, a lot of times when you're teaching others, you're learning yourself. Amen. Do you ever realize that? Yes. I've learned more as being a teacher than I did as being a student. Because you have to study more, and you listen more, and you look into it differently than you did when you're just listening. And so if when you start teaching, you actually increase in knowledge and wisdom and understanding, and you know how to instruct others. So, we must have the Word of God in us if we're going to do that. We must know it experientially and not intelligently, only intelligently. Intelligently means a mental awareness of the, of the Bible. There are many people in many denominations that have an intellectual knowledge of the Bible. They could sit down with any one of us and have a, a good debate and maybe even give us pause. They, they know the Bible. They know what the words say. They have an intellectual knowledge, but they don't have an experiential knowledge of it. They don't have it where it's in their heart and it's changed their life. It's a practical practicing knowledge. That's where you really learn the Bible, when you put it into practice, and it becomes part of who you are, your character, and, and, and your makeup. Look over in the book of Hebrews chapter 5 with me. Hebrews chapter 5, and let's just begin reading, uh, uh, let's just begin reading verse 11. The writer here says, Of whom we have many things to say, and hard to be uttered, seeing ye are dull of hearing. The writer here, good possibility that's Paul, he's saying, I have a lot I'd like to tell you, and a lot I'd like to teach you, but you're dull of hearing. It's, it's, the sound just bounces off the wall. You're, you're not receiving it experientially. And it's not changing your life. Because, see, when you receive it experientially, it affects something in your life. It changes your life. And he goes on down. He says, for, when, for the time ye ought to be teachers. 
not just a pastor, not just a Sunday school teacher, but you should be teachers by now. You've been saved long enough that you can teach others the word of God. He said, ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as having need of milk and not strong meat. Sometimes pastors are the last ones to know. Sometimes pastors are naive. We, we think that everybody's getting everything we say and everybody's on the same page and everybody knows what we think they know because we've preached it or taught it. And then we find out they didn't really have it. They, they, they needed to go back to the, the very oracle, the very principal things of the Bible. They, they couldn't handle the strong meat. He goes on down to say here a little bit further, he says, uh, for in the using of milk, the use... Excuse me, for everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat, the deep teachings, the deep doctrines of the word of God, belongs to them who are of full age, even those who by reason of what? Use. Yeah. By use have their senses exercised to be able to discern both good and evil. You have to use what you learn. What your pastor preaches to you, you need to go home and you need to think about that and you need to put that into use in your life and you need to practice it, whether he's teaching on tithing or giving or faith witnessing or whatever it is. It doesn't do any good to know it intellectually if you don't go out and practice it experientially, practically in your life. That's the way you really learn it is when you put it to use in your life. So the Bible is able to teach us, which is a wonderful, wonderful thing. Another thing the Bible does, I don't like this one too much. Well, actually, I, I shouldn't say that. There's times when I don't like it, but then I usually come to find out that it was good. But the Bible scolds us. The Bible reproves us. When you get into the book, and if you're not living for Jesus, the book's going to scold you. It's going to reprove you of that. And it's just like sitting in a church. I think some of the best messages that I've heard that I remember and retain the most are the ones that challenge me the most. The ones that made me feel uncomfortable, where I was squirming in the seat, you know, and I felt like somebody's walking on my feet. But it pointed out things in my life that weren't right, that weren't what they should be for the glory of God. And the holy book, the Bible, uh, it, it will reprove us, it will admonish us at times. It, it's our standard of conduct. It's not man's opinion, it's not society's opinion, it's not our government's opinion. It's what the Bible says. It's our standard of our conduct. 2 Timothy chapter 3 says, you know, that we're, all Scripture is given for doctrine, is profitable for doctrine and for reproof. The Bible's profitable for reproof. It, it, it's a good thing when God takes us to the woodshed. If he didn't take us to the woodshed, we would never learn. Uh, chastisement in the Bible is, is basically interpreted for instruction. When you, when you chastise a child for disobedience, you're instructing them in the right way. And, and it's a good thing, the Bible tells us, to be instructed, to be, in, to be chastened of God. He said, if I don't chasten you, then you're not my children. <laughs> you know, you're bastards instead of sons. So the Bible will sometimes take us to the woodshed. It's profitable for reproof, and we get into it. But if we don't get into it and read it, it's not going to be profitable for us in reproof. We're not going to come to an awareness, and we're not going to realize. We're not doing what God wants us to do, when we should do it, and how we should do it. Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 23 says, for, the commandment is a, for thy commandment is a lamp, and the law is light, and reproof of instruction are the ways of life. Reproof of instruction are the ways of life. When we get, in, when we get admonished of God and his word, he's really giving us life, a more abundant life, because he blesses us when we're living for Jesus. And when we're instructed that we're not, and we get corrected by the Word of God, and then we have a better life in Christ. Not that our life in Christ isn't already good, great, but we have an exceeding wonderful life when the Bible instructs us. Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 31 says, The ear that heareth reproof of life abideth among the wise. How many times in your life has a preacher preached, pastor preached, and he preached the Bible, and it was, a, it was a message that was admonishing you. It was reproving you. And the temptation is, like Satan, that, you know, that little demon sitting on your shoulder, oh, don't listen to that. You don't like that. And you turn it off. You don't want to listen to it. 
You don't want to hear it. Even though it's good. God sent it there for good. He sent it there for instruction. He sent it because he says he chastens those that he loves. And so when he chastens us through the word, when he admonishes us through the word, it says the ear that heareth reproof of life abideth among the wise. You're a wise man when you listen, even though we're hurt sometimes. You know, and it, I don't think there's probably anyone in here that sometimes the message hasn't challenged us. It hasn't walked all over our feet. You know, either what we're doing that we shouldn't or what we're not doing that we should be doing. And we go out of church sometimes feeling a little bit down. But that was instruction that we needed that would make us live a better life. So the Bible reproves us. It's profitable for reproof. It's a good thing for reproof. We reprove our children. Why? Because we love them. Amen. And it's profitable for our children to be corrected, to be chastened in whatever manner that you, you do. Uh, you do it because you love them. It takes, it takes love to reprove someone because you've got you to gotta, uh, step out of your comfort zone. We don't like to do that. You know, my dad and mom used to tell me all the time, mostly my mom, uh, you know, this is hurting me more than you. And I didn't believe it. I knew you, you're crazy. <laughs> I didn't tell her that. It would have been hurting me a lot more. But it did hurt me when I started spanking my children. It hurt me to do that. I had to step out of my comfort zone. But I needed to do that for them because it was profitable for them to be reproved of something wrong, right? Yeah. But, here's a but. I, boy, I love the buts in the Bible, don't you? Man, there, there are some great buts in the Bible that, that transition from, from one point to the other point. But the Bible also comforts us. Amen. One time I spanked my son Brian. He may be listening. This is why I don't like to be videoed. <laughs> One time I spanked my son Brian. Forgive me, son, if you're listening to this. And uh, he, he deserved it. But um, I, he was crying, and I sent him to his room. And my, my wife and I were sitting on the couch, and we sent him to his room and said, don't come out till you quit crying. And so uh, he sat in there for a few minutes, and we could hear him crying, you know, sniffling. <laughs> You know, and finally he opened the door and he stuck his head out and he says, can I come out now? And, and you know, and he says, I quit crying. And I said, yeah. And he came out and he came over to, to us and he got up on my lap and he sat there. And, and I said, Brian, do you know why I spanked you? And then he said, and I think he did this on purpose myself, but then he said, because you love me so much. <laughs> you talk about just wanting to rip your heart out, you know. But that was the truth. It was, it's not comfortable to do that. But after we spanked him, we hugged him, and we comforted him. And the Bible does that in his word. Amen. After he reproves us, he, he draws us in, he wraps his arms around us, and he comforts us. Oh, there's nobody that can comfort us like God can comfort us. Um, look over in uh, Romans chapter 15 and verse 4. He says, for whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning. God didn't just send this book to be a, a set on a bookshelf. These things were written for our learning today. Those things that were written aforetime, they were written for me today and for you today. For our learning that we through patience and comfort of scriptures might have hope. Amen. Through the comfort of scriptures, we have hope. God's not mad at me anymore. He, well, not that he ever was mad at us. He may have been a little bit disappointed in us, like he was Israel from time to time. But when he, once he corrects us, once we've repented, once we've corrected that error in our life of not serving him like we should be serving him, then God pulls us in and he gives us that comfort and that hope. God still loves me. God still loves me. And oh, what peace that brings. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Brother... Boren and I were talking about this. I guess it was yesterday, brother, wasn't it? 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Begin reading verse 1. Paul writes here. And, and you understand who he's writing to. It helps us to understand who's writing and who he's writing to and what the situation of the writing. And the church at Corinth was a church that was troubled. They had, they had issues. <laughs> we think some churches today have issues. Every church has had issues. But some churches had more than others. And Paul had to get on them a few times. He had to give them the word of reproof. And, you know, but here he says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth with all the saints which are in all Arcadia. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be God, 
even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, Amen. who comforted us in all our tribulations that we may be able to comfort them also which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. You see, God comforts us, and, and then we are able by that comfort to learn how to comfort others. You know, have you known somebody that's died, and someone you love, and, and, and a friend, a loved one died, and you just don't know what to say to them. You want to comfort them. You, you know, and sometimes, you know, the comforter, that word comforter means to come alongside. And sometimes we just got to come alongside. Sometimes all we have to do is let them know, I'm here. We don't have to say anything. We don't have to do anything. We just have to be there, and they feel that sense that you're here for them. Comfort them with the way that you've been comforted. We learn through the comfort that God gives us after he's had to reprove us or correct us or chasten us. Then he comforts us, and, and, and we've learned when we've been through trouble that God's come alongside, the Holy Spirit's come alongside, and it's comforted us. And we learn through that experience of that that we go and we can comfort others. Because that's what we're supposed to do. For as the suffering of Christ abounded in us, so our consolation or comfort also abound us by Christ. And whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual. There's that effecting, actual working in the uh, enduring of the same suffering, which we also suffer. Or whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. All oh, listen, we, we're comforted of the Word of God. When you're, when you're hurting... When you're, when you're struggling, when this, this pandemic is getting people down and, and we're beginning to doubt we'll ever have sanity again, we'll ever be able to go to White Castles and get a hamburger again, you know, when we're starting to really have problems, just get into the Word of God. And you know what's going to happen? He's going to come alongside and he's going to pat you on the shoulder. It's all right. I'm still on the throne. I, I'm, I'm still here. I'm God. In the year that King Uzziah died, Isaiah says, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. And you know what that means, don't you? When the king died in that culture, it meant chaos was coming because the king held the country together. And it, they, they had their followers that, that had their government and the rule. And when the king died, there began to be uh, chaos and upheaval in the, in the government. People were killing uh, heirs to the throne because they wanted to be king. And they were trying to get the kingship themselves. And, and, and all of these things began to crumble and fall apart. And the enemies heard that the king died in Israel. So now it's a good time to attack him because they, the head's been lost, you know, of the, of the king kingdom. And so people began to worry and fret. Oh, what are we going to do now? Uzziah, you know, uh, uh, he was a good king. And who's going to take his place, you know? And we worry about that every election Year, don't we? You know, oh, what's going to happen if Trump loses the election, you know? And we start panicking and all that. But you know, Isaiah wasn't looking down. He said, I saw the Lord high. He was looking up. He was looking up. And God comforted him. Amen. And that's what we have to do. Look up through the word of God and, and feel God comfort you. This is going to pass. You know, th these things must come to pass, right, brother? Amen. And you notice it says they come to pass, not come to stay. <laughs> you know, and God will comfort us. The Word of God comforts us uh, all the time. Look at Psalms 119. I don't know what time I was supposed to preach to, but since the pastor went over this morning, I guess I can go over a little bit. I, I think he went over. I, I, I heard his wife say he did. <laughs> uh, Psalms 119. And look at verse 52. The psalmist says, I remember thy judgments of old. That's the word of God. O Lord, and, how, and have comforted myself. How did he comfort himself? When he remembered the words of old. The word of God. When we remember those words that we meditate upon and we hide in our heart that we sin not against God. When we remember those then you can comfort yourself. Just like David comforted himself. He strengthened himself. We, we can do the same thing. Verse 81 says, My soul fainteth for thy salvation, but I hope in thy word. He says, I, 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 my soul fainteth. It becomes weary, waiting for your salvation. A deliverance, I think, is the thought here, not uh, spiritual salvation in that sense. But he says, but I, I, I comforted myself. I have hope in the word. The word is profitable to us, folks. We need to realize that. It's, it's profitable to us in time of trouble. Look at John chapter 16. 
In a time of trouble, where should we go? We, we need to go to the Word of God and, and get in there and read and, 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 and just let the Holy Spirit comfort us through the, the reading. In John chapter 16, verse 1, it says, These things have I spoken unto you, that ye should not be offended. They have put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think he doeth God's service. I think that time is here. You know? And these things will they do unto you because they have not known the Father nor me. But these things have I told you that when the time shall come, ye may remember that I uh, told you of them, and these things I said unto you at the beginning because I was with you. He said, I want you to remember so that you can be comforted. Look at verse 33. This is Pastor Reynolds' favorite verse. He says in John chapter 16, verse 33, These things have I spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. Now that word peace there is a, not the peace in the absence of problems. It's not peace in the absence of tribulation or absence of trouble. It's the peace of in spite of those things. You can be at peace. Amen. These things have I spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world, you're going to have tribulation. But be of good cheer, because I have overcome the world. Oh, there's that comfort. Amen. We have the we read the back of the book, folks. We win. <laughs> you know, it's 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 a it's a wonderful comfort. We can have comfort in trouble, but we can even have comfort in a time of death. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil, because I'm never alone. Thou art with me. I well, I'm better. I'm on live. I better not say that. So I won't go there. It might not be appreciated. Let's go over to uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Probably one of the scariest times in our lives is when we've heard these terrible words, you've only got days to live. You've only got months to live. You've only got weeks to live. And, and we... That uncertainty, like today's situations, and that unknown that's on the other side of that door, it causes us to fear, and it causes us to worry, and to be uh, depressed, and discouraged, and to doubt. And when, no greater time in the world to be in the Word of God than have somebody read it to us, or read it ourselves. And then, of course, it talks here about the rapture, and verse 13 says, But I would not have you be ignorant brethren concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them which are asleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Isn't that comfort to know that? Well, we're going to see our loved ones again. I, I miss my wife every day, but I know one day I'm going to see her again. That's comforting. And for this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend. <laughs> and I like that. He's not sending some flunky to do it. The Lord himself uh, will descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise for first. Then we which are alive, he ain't forgot about us. We and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we be with him, with the Lord. Uh, wherefore, because of that knowledge of that, because you've read this in the book, then there's profit in that reading. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Amen. Even in death, even in the prospect of death, or sharing death with someone else, we can have comfort through the book. Isn't that profitable? I mean, isn't there times when you wish you just knew what to say? You wish you knew how to say it? You wish you knew how to act or how to react? Right here. It's profitable. It'll prepare you for all of that, all of those things. Another thing the Bible does for us, it cleanses us. When we get defiled, in the Old Testament days of the tabernacle, when the priest would go into the courtyard of the, of the, of the tabernacle and approach the, the, the tent, the whole, the, the holy, uh, lost my train of thought here. The outer court uh, of the tabernacle, they would approach up there, they would be the altar of incense, the altar of sacrifice first, where the sacrifice would have to be offered in bloodshed, blood before water. And then there was the, the, the brazen laver where the priest would stop by. They've already been saved, if you will. They've been cleansed, if you will, from their sin, but they've defiled themselves by walking in the world. They stop by and they cleanse themselves ceremonially at the brazen laver Amen. before they go into the, to the holies. 
And then in the holies, there was a table of showbread, the, the, the menorah on the right-hand side, and then there was an altar of incense in front. And then in the holy of holies, which only the priest would in once a year, um, to offer sacrifice for himself and also for the people uh, there. But before they did that, they had to be cleansed. Why do you think God told uh, Moses when he approached the burning bush, take thy shoes from off thy feet for the ground for which you stand is holy ground? Because his shoes carried him through the defilement of the world. It was symbolic. Take those off. You're standing in holy ground. You need to be cleansed to come before me. Say the captain of the host of the Lord's army in uh, Joshua chapter 4, I think it was, told Joshua to take off his shoes when he stood before the, I believe, the pre-incarnate appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he told him, you're standing on holy ground. Well, when we come before God and church and stuff like that, we need to prepare ourselves. Each and every one of us need to prepare ourselves. And we need to just pray and ask, Lord, Lord, strengthen me, help me, forgive me of my shortcomings and failures. Forgive me of my sin, Lord, because I'm coming to meet with you. And we read the book, and the book can cleanse us. Look at John chapter 3. John chapter, excuse me, John chapter 15, I'm sorry. John chapter 15, verse 3. Just for the sake of time, we'll just read one verse. He says, Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. You're clean through the word. John chapter 17, verse 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Now, what does that word sanctify mean? It means to cleanse. It means to set apart, uh, uh, to, to sanctify, to be pure, to be holy. Uh, uh, it says, sanctify them through thy word. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them in the world. And for their sake I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. And the Bible tells us that his word is the truth. And the church is the pillar in the ground of the truth. And we're to protect the truth and we're to uphold the truth. Look at Psalms chapter 119. I haven't got to preach for a while, so this is kind of like fun, you know. It's like, <laughs> you guys might never get to go home. Psalms chapter 119, verse 9. I think that's where I want to go first. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his ways? By taking heed thereunto according to thy word. You want to cleanse your ways? Whatever it is that needs to be cleansed, the book is profitable. Amen. The book is profitable. Verse 11 says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Not only does it cleanse us, cleanse us from our sins, when we hide its word, his word in our heart, it prevents us from sinning. Uh, Benjamin Franklin said, I believe, that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So hide this word in your heart so that you don't sin and you won't have to worry about being cleansed later on for it, right? Psalms uh, 119 and verse 105 says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. It'll direct you in the, in, in the way, not only each step that you take, but it'll direct you in, the, in the, the journey that you're on. Immediately, and that which is ahead of you, his word will direct you. Well, we got one more verse, we'll, we'll, one more point. And if you don't mind, I'll squeeze that in here. Uh, the Bible equips us. Go back to our text verse in uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse uh, 17. We'll read verse 16 with it. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it is profitable. It's profitable for doctrine. It's profitable for reproof. It's profitable for correction. It's profitable for instruction. It's profitable in righteousness for a reason. So that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Everything we need to do to maintain good works is in this book. How can we know what good works are? How can we know what works qualify as good by God if we do not get in his word? That's what directs us to good works. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, study. Study, that word study means to be diligent, to mean fast, to mean quick at it. Get right into it. Study to show thyself approved unto God. We don't have to show ourselves approved unto man. We have to show ourselves approved unto God. Show ourselves approved unto God, a workman 
that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The word of God equips us. It makes us a workman, rightly dividing the word of truth. It's the only, it's the weapon that we're to use, the sword of the spirit, which is what? The word of God. It's our offensive weapon to attack this world. Um, And we're to preach that word faithfully, committed to it. Psalms 119, verse 151 and 152 says, Thou art near, O Lord, and all thy commandments are truth. Concerning thy testimonies, I have known of old that thou hast founded them forever. It's all truth. It's eternal forever. There's profit for you, and there is profit for me in this book. Why don't we take advantage of it? We take advantage of every kind of worldly profit that there is. The Bible, my old Bible, unfortunately, not unfortunately, but this is not an old one, but my old Bible, though the cover is worn and the pages are torn, and through places bear traces of tears, yet more precious in gold is this book worn and old that can shatter and scatter my fears. This old book is my guide, tis my friend by my side. It will, be, it will lighten and brighten my way. And each promise I find smooths and gladdens the mind as I read it and heed it each day. To this book I will cling, of its worth I will sing, through great, though great losses and crosses be mine. For I cannot despair, though surrounded by care, while I possessing this blessing divine. There's profit in the book for you and for me. Brother.